The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 17 Lucas lay awake. His listless eyes looked at the light squeaking past the blinds. All night, he tossed and turned, thinking about Sarah and the room across the hallway. She was so close, yet so far. Somehow, he had to talk to her. He had so many questions, but he didn't want to bombard her or make her feel like she was being interrogated. How should he approach her? If this was strictly business, he wouldn't even give it a second thought. Closing million-dollar deals was child's play compared to what he was attempting to do. He did one talk to their wife, let alone convince her to give him a second chance after all the mistakes he made. He was so far out of his depth. And then there was Zoe. He didn't have a clue how to be a dad. His own wasn't particularly attentive and disappeared when he was young. Apparently, his father had been so upset with his grandmother, refused to turn the company over to him. He abandoned his family to seek his fortune and prove himself. According to his grandmother, his father died penniless. It probably was just as well he had no memories of the man. Zoe deserved better, but it left him in a quandary. Who did he know who was a good father? Two names immediately came to mind. Julius Delaire and Silas Prescott. Both were adored by their children and seemed complete naturals despite the years they were separated from them. Julius's children were five years old before he even met them, and a full ten years separated Silas from his. If they could do it, certainly he could. Maybe. He wished he could talk to them. After Sarah left, Delaire and Prescott severed all business ties with Stanton and its associates. Naturally, several companies abandoned Stanton in favor of doing business with Delaire and Prescott, but there were still plenty of others willing to work with him. Lucas had to do some reshuffling and reorganize his business's projects, but he made it work. There was no denying Stanton Incorporated had fallen behind a few steps, but it was nothing they couldn't make up eventually. Now, though, he was hesitant to contact either Julius or Silas. He doubted they would be happy to hear from him. Would they even be willing to listen to him after everything? With a sigh, he sat up. Stepping into the bathroom, he splashed water on his face, trying to marshal the depressing thoughts that swirled in his mind. Still groggy, he dressed in simple trousers and a t-shirt before heading downstairs for coffee. As he descended, the smell of breakfast drifted up toward him to greet him. Eggs, bacon, and salsa. Reaching the kitchen, he saw Ulima at the stove, happily humming as she made huevos rancheros. At the table, Zoe sat, coloring alongside Alan, who chuckled at her antics. How long have you been here? Lucas demanded. An hour. Alan shrugged. And he didn't wake me? She's much better company. Alan smirked, giving Zoe a wink as she giggled. Morning, Daddy. Zoe smiled. Lucas froze mid-step. Whatever he was about to say was forgotten. Those two simple words sent his mind spinning, and he trembled with the longing to hear it again. You can say hi back, Dad. Alan said, noticing his frozen state, causing Zoe to snicker again. She gazed at him with shining greenish eyes and a smile just as bright as she said. You're silly, Daddy. 
Lucas finally stirred, approaching the table. Patting Zoe on the head, he leaned down to kiss her forehead. Morning, sweet pea. Zoe giggled. What? No morning kiss for me? Alan asked. Eh, she's cuter. Lucas scowled at him, which made Zoe giggle more. Senor? Ulima gave Lucas his morning coffee. He sipped it with a grimace. Zoe wrinkled her nose as she watched him. After a moment, she said, Daddy, coffee's bad for you. You should drink tea. Mommy says it's healthier. Your mommy really likes tea, doesn't she? Alan asked. Uh-huh. Zoe nodded. Mommy drinks tea every day, in the morning and afternoon and evening. She has special teas for everything. Teas for colds and aches and upset tummies. Alan raised an eyebrow, glancing at Lucas, in as much to say now was a good time to get information as any other. The gesture and intention was not lost on him. If anyone knew Sarah, it would certainly be her daughter. Your mommy is special, isn't she? Alan asked. Mommy is the most special. We're both miracles. Oh yeah? How do you figure that? Because we almost died. Zoe said, to the shock of her listeners. Right. That's just a figure of speech, I suppose. Alan cleared his throat. No, it's true. Mommy said I was born too early and had to be in an incubator until I was finished growing. Zoe said matter-of-factly. And Mommy had com... compli... Complications? Alan supplied. Uh-huh. She had a lot of bleeding, and the doctors had a hard time stopping it. Zoe nodded. So you see, we are real miracles. Grandma Yaya said so. Olima quietly set the plate with tortillas covered in eggs, sunny side up, with mild salsa and bacon in front of Zoe, with a strained smile. Zoe happily picked up her fork to eat, perfectly happy with an ethnic-style breakfast. Ulima gave her a gentle pat and a warm smile, even as her eyes shined with tears, though she said nothing. Alan grimaced and looked at Lucas. Lucas stood staring at Zodi with his forgotten coffee still in hand. He had gone pale as a ghost, his hands trembling. It couldn't be. There had to be a mistake. But if it were true, he could have lost both Sarah and Zoe in one instant and never known. Just the thought of what might have been sent his mind into overdrive. If Zoe hadn't survived scenes like yesterday at the zoo, it would never have happened. How could Sarah have coped with the loss alone, without comfort, or anyone to share the burden and pain? And Sarah, what if she hadn't survived? It was unlikely anyone would have told him. He would have gone on searching, never knowing it was futile. What would have happened to Zoe then? Would Ruth have taken her in? Maybe the Grandma Yaya she mentioned. Taylor? Would he even have been given a chance to meet his daughter and mourn Sarah's loss? God, he was such an idiot. Unaware of his inner turmoil, Zoe happily hummed as she ate. Under her chair, Daisy waited for any morsels she might drop. Despite her difficult entry into the world, Zoe was full of energy. One would have never guessed she had been premature and struggled to survive. Alan cleared his throat with a loud ahem. Somehow it stirred Lucas from his thoughts. His gaze went again to the little girl, happily eating her breakfast. 
He was struck with the desire to keep her within sight at all times. Whether it was fatherly instincts to protect his family, or just desperation not to lose them again, he didn't know. But he was determined to keep both safe. Morning, senora. Ulima smiled as Sarah came downstairs. Lucas tore his gaze from Zoe to marvel at the new vision. Her attire was simple and functional. Jeans, denim jacket, and an orange, gold, and red striped shirt. The colors popped against the faded blue denim, yet despite the simplicity, Lucas was mesmerized by her every curve tantalizingly hinted by the way the jeans and shirt hugged her. Did he really think her plain? How had he been so blind? Though she tried to ignore him, her gaze briefly met his before she looked away. A pink tinge came to her cheeks. Lucas wasn't sure if she was embarrassed by his brazen stare or if she had noticed his own toned form stretching in the fabric of his t-shirt. He hoped it was the latter. From a young age, his grandmother instilled the need to be physically fit and healthy, so he had always maintained a strict workout schedule, though yesterday was a reminder he neglected cardio in favor of strength training, a situation he would rectify to ensure he could keep up with Zoe. If he planned to keep her in sight, he couldn't let her run circles around him. Here you are. Ulima smiled handing Sarah a steaming cup. Sarah accepted with a stiff smile, aware she was still being watched. Bringing it close to her lips, she hesitated, sniffing it before taking a sip. Suddenly, her stiff expression eased, and she smiled genuinely. You remembered. Oh, of course I did. Ulima was indignant that anyone thought she would fail her duties because she would forget something so simple. You always like to start your day with honey lemon tea because you like to begin with something sweet and refreshing. Sarah blushed, but her expression remained soft and pleased. It seemed she and Ulima really had gotten along, which made the fact Sarah let the housekeeper go even more bizarre. But it also highlighted again how little Lucas actually knew. They knew she liked tea based on the amount she stored in the kitchen, but he hadn't realized she preferred certain ones depending on the time of day. Mommy, Ulima made breakfast! Zoe excitedly exclaimed. She made eggs! Trying her best to ignore the men in the room who kept staring at her, Sarah sat next to Zoe, saying, Franchieres, it looks delicious. Mom, Senora. Ulima announced. Before Sarah could protest, Ulima delivered a plate and set it in front of her. Ulima smiled, enjoying the amazed and somewhat resigned look Sarah gave her. Without a word, the housekeeper set a bottle of Tabasco in front of her, knowing full well Sarah was partial to spicy foods. Shaking her head, Sarah nonetheless sprinkled the sauce on breakfast, happy to once again enjoy the nice cooking. Aren't you going to eat? Zoe asked, looking at her and this. Oh. Alan hesitated. We don't really eat in the morning. Mommy says breakfast is the most important meal of the day. You should always have one with plenty of protein and vitamins. Your mommy's a smart woman. Uli was set, setting a plate in front of Alan and another on the table with a pointed look at Lucas. He hesitated, but he didn't want to set a bad example for his daughter. Lucas sat down, glancing at Sarah, who was back to ignoring him. Baby steps. With a sigh, Lucas picked up the Tabasco and sprinkled it on his eggs and salsa. Mommy! Daddy likes spicy 
fancy food just like you. Zoe exclaimed. That's why I never steal food from this place. Alan said with a shiver. And why I always keep breath in this handy for after. Zoe giggled while Lucas glared at him with a silent promise to pay him back. The threat was mild as Sarah quietly chuckled. Lucas glanced in her direction, feeling his cheeks warm. Normally, he hated the embarrassing situation, but hearing her laugh in his presence, he thought he didn't actually mind at all that. Sarah glanced at him, and seeing he was watching her, quickly looked away. So, you have plans today? Trying to keep the mood light. Statue of Liberty! Zoe bounced in her seat. Sarah smiled. I bought our reservations online this morning, so as soon as we're done eating, we can drive out to the battery. We can look at the memorials before we get on the ferry. Yeah! Zoe cheered. Ferry? Lucas repeated, his mind filling with images of rough seas and boats, struggling to stay afloat. I'm not sure that's a good idea. I'm um, sorry? Sarah looked at him, startled. It's an island, so the only way to get there is by ferry. Boats are dangerous. What about the rough seas? They could sink. Sarah blinked, not sure if he was being serious before saying. I think we'll be fine. If you're worried, we can go too. Alan said. I've never been to the Statue of Liberty. Really? So That's not necessary. I'm sure you have work to do. Not at all. Lucas said. It's Sunday. I think I'm entitled to a day off. In truth, he usually works seven days a week. Sunday. Skeleton and crew of sorts, so the office was quiet and made a good environment to catch up. But right now, nothing was further from his mind. Sarah chewed her lip. Her eyes vacillated from uncertainty to surprise to worry. It seemed she was still unsure about his motivation and torn between wanting to keep her distance and honoring their agreement. Will we get to climb all the way to the top? Zoe asked. Um, no, baby. Sarah shook her head. I'm afraid not. Aww. Why not? Well, you're not big enough. You have to be at least 42 inches tall. Remember the fair last year? You wanted to get on some of the rides, but they wouldn't let you. Zoe pouted. I wish I was bigger. You'll grow up soon. Sarah smiled. I don't want you to grow up too soon. I like having my baby little. Mommy, I won't be little forever. True, but you'll always be my baby. So, when are your reservations? Alan asked, looking at his mom. Sarah hesitated and answered. 10.30. Alan went back to his car. A few minutes later, he looked at Lucas and nodded. Lucas breathed easier. He would be able to After breakfast, they piled into Sarah's SUV with Lucas, once again riding shotgun, and Alan in the backseat with Zoe. Much to her disappointment, Daisy had to stay behind, but Ulima promised to take good care of the pup. Sarah's phone chimed with directions to the paid parking area where they disembarked. Since they were early, they took a little time to look around Battery Park, stopping to take pictures at some of the monuments, including the East Coast Memorial of the Giant Bronze Eagle, commemorating servicemen lost on the Atlantic during World War II, as well as the Korean War Veterans Memorial and the Immigrants Memorial. Zoe was still a little young to understand all the history, but she dutifully listened and maintained a contemplative look throughout. 
Reaching the castle, they picked up their tickets and headed to the security checkpoint. They were still early enough that they got through rather quickly and boarded their ferry, heading up to the third deck, where they would have their best view of the statue as they approached. Zoe bounced on her heels, wanting to run along the deck, even as it quickly filled. Fearful of losing sight of her in the growing crowd, Lucas scooped her up. After yesterday, he was rapidly beginning to understand that his daughter was a disappearing answer. Surprisingly, she didn't try to get away. Instead, the higher perspective gave Zoe a better view of the ocean and the island that was their goal. Sarah snapped pictures, giving Zoe plenty to show when she told everyone about their trip. Reaching Liberty Island, they disembarked and they headed for the visitor center. After a brief discussion, they elected not to join the guided tour, but checked out a phone so they could listen to the audio tour as they wandered on their own. Though they couldn't climb to the crown, Sarah had purchased tickets that granted them access to the pedestal, allowing them several scenic views. Naturally, Zoe wanted several souvenirs from the gift shop before they returned to the ferry to take it to Ellis Island and the Immigration Museum. Though informative, the museum was not quite as interesting to the three year old. She happily held on to her parents' hands, giggling all the while. On the ferry back, Sarah's phone buzzed. Taking it out, she found it was a text from Ava. She smiled. Zoe, look, Aunty Ava wants us to come over for dinner tonight. Really? Yeah, the boys are looking forward to playing with you and Daisy and... Sarah frowned. She says you're invited too. Lucas blinked in surprise. Even when he was on good terms with Julius and Silas, they never invited him to their home. He was rather nervous what Silas would say. But as he was officially invited, it should be fine. Oblivious to his internal debate, Zoe happily bounced in his arms, excited about dinner and playing with their cousins she only knew from stories. The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 18 By the time they returned home, Zoe not only wore out her excitement, but had fallen asleep. Sarah gathered her up and carried her inside. Willem greeted them as they entered, but fell silent when she saw the little one was out. She had made soap appears as a special treat, but they would have to wait. Do you need help? Lucas asked. Sarah shook her head before heading upstairs to lay her down. Daisy yapped, circling her feet and trailed after her. Lucas waited anxiously, wondering if Sarah would come back. Perhaps they could finally talk. When she didn't, he quietly went in search of her, only to find her lying on the bed beside Sally, also fast asleep. As he peered into the room, only Daisy stood. Curled up beside Sally, the corgi raised its head, its large ears perked up. When Lucas didn't say anything, the pup dropped its head and went back to sleep. Lucas gazed at the three-year-old and her mother, both comfortably asleep. He leaned against the wall, drinking in the side. Both looked so content. He was glad Sarah could at least sleep comfortably, even if being back made her anxious. Though the car ride out had been awkward, Sarah relaxed during the tour. Her smile was less strained, and she didn't flinch every time he stood beside her. Baby steps. He kept telling himself that, but it wasn't easy. His arms itched to hold her to finally know whether or not she fit in his embrace the way he imagined. But she wouldn't allow that. She barely allowed him to be in the same room. Lucas had no choice but to take it slow, but he only had two weeks. One slip up, she could disappear forever with their daughter, and he would have no one to blame but himself. With a sigh, he stepped out of the room, quietly closing the door. What did he do? Never thought I'd see the day you were completely with. Alan commented. Lucas turned to look at him as he stood at the top of the stairs. He glared, but he couldn't help. From the moment he saw Sarah at the party, she consumed his thoughts. And Zoe, 
Lucas played against the wall, remembering his words three years ago. If she ends up being pregnant, get rid of her. How could he have been so stupid? Sarah was a wonderful mother. Gentle, caring, firm, but understanding. He was fairly certain she had no idea how beautiful she was when she smiled and played with Zoe. She was already beautiful, but with Zoe she was felt dead gorgeous. God, he'd been so blind. Luke, I need to know everything. Lucas said. I don't care how, just give me the information. Everything about Sarah and Zoe. Please. Yeah, okay. Alan nodded. No doubt Zoe's statement from the morning still resonated. It had been quite a shock to all of them. With the advances of modern medicine, one seldom heard about such complications during pregnancy or birth. Yet that didn't mean they didn't happen, and not everyone was as lucky as Sarah and Zoe who both managed to survive. While Sarah and Zoe napped, Lucas nervously paced the house. Suddenly everything seemed dangerous and potentially hazardous. How could he protect them from everything? Finally, exhausted, he collapsed on the couch. This much worry would be the death of him. Senor. Lucas jerked to attention as Ulama offered him a warm cup. With a nervous smile, he accepted taking a drink before he really looked at what was in the mug. He frowned. The taste was similar to coffee, but not. Dandelion. Coffee. Senora taught me how to make it. It's very good and very healthy. Senora loves it. Lucas hesitated but drank it. So, do you remember how Sarah likes your tea? I remember a few things. Ulama. And food preferences? Ulama smiled. Senora always liked it when I made something special. She used to say life is too short to eat the same boring things. Lucas's lips twitched with a smile. So Sarah liked ethnic foods. He wondered when that started. Ellen did say she went to Paris to do research for one of her books. Perhaps then? You two seem to get along well. Lucas said. Why did she let you go? Ulama grew pensive before answering. I think I made a mistake. Mistake? Yes. I felt sorry for her, alone, in this big house. It, I started to pity her. And I think that was more painful to her than being alone. Mama cautiously said. Senora didn't want pity. And I don't think she likes others to see her pain. She's a very private person. She prefers to suffer in private. She doesn't like to bother others with it. Lucas grimaced. He understood that. He preferred to face his problems on his own too, but he usually made them worse. If it wasn't for Alan, Lucas wasn't sure he would be able to solve any of them. Sarah shouldered everything alone. His neglect, society's ridicule, her pregnancy and raising Sally, being the author. He didn't even know that kind of strength existed. Alina, do you have children? Lucas suddenly asked. Yes. Two daughters. They are grown now. Does it ever get easier? Senor? I mean, do you ever stop worrying? No, Senor. I'm afraid not. You worry more. Ah, terrific. Lucas sighed, sipping the dandelion coffee. Senor? Oh, my hesitant. You are not going to leave her alone again, are you? Lucas's gaze snapped toward her. Her face was a mask of worry. She truly cared for Sarah and Zoe. Considering the past, he couldn't blame her for doubting him. judging his reaction carefully before nodding. She returned to the kitchen. Apparently he was convincing enough for the housekeeper. Now he just had to persuade Sarah. Lucas 
Davis nervously stepped out of the car looking at the brownstone. He'd never been in before, so he was surprised by its rather ordinary facade. There was nothing about it that stood out from the others, despite the family that called it home. Sarah and Zoe climbed out after him, along with the excited Corgi. After being left behind earlier, the puppy was eager to join them this time. Alan gave him a wave of encouragement before driving away. Lucas sighed. He needed all the support he could get. This visit was not going to be easy. He trailed after Sarah as she led Zoe up the steps to the front door. When they had climbed into the car, Sarah rattled off the address to Alan with ease. There was no hesitation in her now as she neared the front door. I wondered how many times she visited in the past. Her knock was answered almost immediately as Duncan smiled and ushered them in. Hello! Zoe greeted with her usual enthusiasm. What's your name? He chuckled. I am Duncan. I'm the butler. What's a butler? I take care of the house and manage the staff. He explained, taking their jackets. Oh, so you're like a housekeeper? Zoe asked. Yes, something like that. Duncan agreed. We have a housekeeper too. Her name's Ulima. Duncan nodded with a pleasant smile. After taking care of Isaac and Ben, he was quite used to small children and their questions. But even the boys weren't quite this chatty. It was rather refreshing. No. Duncan nodded to Sarah. It is good to see you again. Sarah smiled. You haven't changed a bit, Duncan. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Stanton. Duncan took his coat. Lucas nearly nodded. It was clear this wasn't Sarah's first visit. He wondered if Ava was the friend Sarah used to visit regularly. At first he was sure it was Ruth, but maybe not. What if... Screeching and laughter echoed as Ben suddenly emerged, running from Isaac, who wielded a foam sword. Stumbling into Duncan, they fell silent as they saw their guests. Daisy barked immediately, drawing their attention. Puppy! Ben exclaimed. Isaac! Ben! Alexis appeared. You know you're not supposed to run in the house. Oh, hi! Auntie Sarah! Hello, Lexi. Hi! Zoe said. This is Daisy. The corgi spun in excited circles, straining on her leash to greet the equally excited boys. Ben scooted closer, giggling as the pup climbed into his lap and licked his face. Ew! Ben, don't let the dog lick your face. Lexi sighed even as she knelt to pet the happy puppy. They had bugged their parents for a pet since Isaac was born, but both seemed hesitant to agree. She was certain their father wanted to say yes, but their mother wasn't as comfortable with the idea. And Lexi had a suspicion that had to do with her mother's childhood. Perhaps another traumatic experience induced by her sadistic aunt. Oh, Sarah! Ava emerged and hurried up to hug him. Hi, Auntie Ava! Zoe smiled, eager for her own help. That's Daisy! Ava looked at the corgi, happily squirming among the kids. Growing up, her father didn't allow pets. The only dog she ever saw were the guard dogs that patrolled the family estate. Her sister once tossed her into the kennels and locked the door, leaving her to face angry, snarling dogs. Luckily, the dogs were in their pens so they couldn't reach her. It still had been a traumatizing experience. Even thinking about it made her tremble. But the puppy sitting with her children was pint-sized and adorable. Hesitantly, she knelt immediately, drawing the corgi's attention. As if sensing the need for caution, Daisy approached slowly and gently licked Ava's hand when she offered it. Ava managed a strange smile as she petted softly. So, how big will she get? Ava asked. She's almost full grown now. Sarah informed, knowing the trauma of Ava's past. Corgis don't get very big. Oh. Ava relaxed. A little dog wasn't so scary. Corgis are actually herding dogs, Sarah informed. Originally, they were bred to herd cattle, believe it or not. Cows? But they're so huge. And 
Daisy's so small, Lexi said. True, but they're quick and can run circles around them, Sarah chuckled. They are fearless and have that herding instinct to round up even a bunch of rowdy boys. Daisy likes to herd our chickens, Zoe agreed. Even though she's not supposed to. Where'd you get her? Ava asked. One of our neighbors breeds them, Sarah said. They also have sheep, so the dogs learn to herd like they were originally bred to do. Ava bit her lip. She wondered if a dog raised on a farm would do all right in the city. The idea that a dog would want to look after the kids and herd them away from places they shouldn't be was an attractive idea. And Daisy certainly was sweet-natured. She needed to think about it some more. Mom, can we take her outside to play? Lexi asked. Um, sure. Just don't get too dirty. Dinner will be in an hour. Yeah! Ben and Isaac were immediately bouncing on their feet. Mommy, did you bring it? Zoe asked. Sarah chuckled, taking a tennis ball out of a canvas bag she brought along, as well as a plastic arm that helped one throw it further. She stowed the leash in the bag alongside the bag of dog food they brought along for the house. Hopefully feeding her would keep her from begging for scraps. Daisy immediately started wriggling with excitement. It was her favourite toy. Zoe cracked, taking the toys from her mother. I'll show you how it works. Zoe declared taking charge. As she was the only one with a pet, it was her responsibility to teach them the best way to play with a cane. Sarah chuckled as the kids took off for the backyard, which was completely fenced in and secure. There, they would be able to run off some energy before dinner. She was actually looking forward to how tuck it out Daisy would be afterwards, as working dogs seemed to have boundless energy. Come on. Ava hooked her arm around Sarah's. We need to catch up, so you better be ready to answer some questions. Ava dragged her off toward the backyard where they could relax on the patio while the kids played. Lucas hesitated, not sure if he should follow. Stanton. Lucas froze at the voice. Turning, he saw Silas watching him from the stairs, though he wasn't sure when the other arrived. Let's talk. Silas said. It didn't look like he was going to be able to avoid it. With a grimace, Lucas nodded, allowing Silas to escort him to the office. Have a seat. Lucas practically collapsed into one of the oversized chairs that faced each other across the coffee table. Silas sat in the other, quietly watching him. Three years ago, he had given Lucas his final word, or at least, that had been his intention. It had been difficult watching Sarah bear the strain of a collapsing marriage. Numerous times he wanted to step in, but she was always insistent to stay out of it. Worse, it seemed Lucas was content to continue the path of self-destruction. When Sarah finally left, Silas was relieved. At least she wouldn't go down with Lucas. Since then, he dropped any interest in Lucas or stayed in Inc. Now that Sarah had returned with a daughter, he couldn't stand on the sidelines. He would not let either be heard again. Say Lucas demanded. Say what? Say it. I am an idiot for ever thinking my wife was anything but perfect and beautiful and amazing. Say I'm a fool for letting her walk away and missing my baby's birth and missing the last three years with them. Well, yes, that about covers it. Silas nodded. Lucas choked back a laugh. Looking at Silas, he was surprised to see an expression of pity. And he realized their situation was not all that different. Silas had also pushed away the woman he loved and lost 10 years with his family, although he was certainly making up for that lost time now. Silas's crimes were slightly less reprehensible than his own. I, I don't know what to do. Lucas finally went. Answer me this. Do you want them? Ever since I saw Sarah in that party, she's all I can think of. When I saw Zoe, I just want to keep them inside at all times. When Sarah said they were going to the Statue of Liberty today, all I can think about is that they were 
was noted in understanding. He was very familiar with that kind of panic. It was why he insisted on guards even before he introduced himself. Even now, Mike and his team continued to shadow Ava and the children wherever they were now, despite Sean, Lexi and Theo insisting they were old enough to take care of themselves. Today, I found out Sarah had complications during the delivery. Lucas said. Zoe was born premature and Sarah almost died from excessive bleeding. They both just died. And I wouldn't have even known. Silas screamed. That was news to him. Ava told him Sarah had a difficult birth, but she hadn't mentioned details. He wondered if she knew. Unless you intend to bubble wrap Zoe, there is no way to prevent her from getting hurt. Silas said. She's going to scrape her knees and bruise her legs. She's going to track in mud and come in covered in grass stains. And there is nothing you can do about it. So, accept it now. With a sigh, Lucas studied the coffee table and noticed the pile of books. He knew Silas enjoyed reading so that in and out of itself wasn't surprising. But looking for him, he suddenly realized they were all written by the same author, Rosemary Thomas. Frowning, Lucas looked at Silas, who maintained a neutral expression, but his eyes shined with men. You know? Lucas asked. Yeah, for a while now. Silas chuckled, grabbing one of the books and paging through it. Hmm. Sarah told Ava. Ava told me. Silas shrugged. And before you ask, Julius and Macy knew too. Actually, Macy knew before any of us. She did. Apparently, she helped Sarah with research for the second book. The second? Lucas thought back, his mind trying to recall the conversation with Alan and remembered the second book was set in Paris. So Sarah met Macy back then. Am I the only one who didn't know? Silas chuckled. No. Aside from her publisher and lawyer, there are only a handful of us who know. You might have noticed Sarah doesn't generally share personal details unless she completely trusts you. Lucas grimaced. Naturally, he didn't qualify, and he hadn't done anything to earn her trust. Actually, once you know it's Sarah who wrote these books, then you must put her black and autobiography. A record of everything she's ever done. Silas tossed the book in his hand to Lucas, who managed to catch it. You should read them if you want to know about her. Lucas looked at him, raising a brow, but Silas looked in earnest. He looked at the book in his hands. Will I remember me? Obviously a play on Will You Remember Me, which was actually quite clever. His gaze drifted to the other books. Box Glove Files, To Catch a Cattail, Sage Advice, Daisies in Bloom. It seemed they were all named after a flower or plant of some sort. Rosemary. Even her pen name was her. He wondered if it was just a gimmick or if she really had an interest in plants. She did like tea, so perhaps it was related to that. I don't really have time to read. Lucas said, returning the book to the pile. Make time. Silas insisted. I got enough of it. Lucas stood nervously pacing. Sarah hardly even acknowledges me. She won't talk to me. I... So it finally happened. Silas sighed. Better late than never. What are you talking about? Well... No one can accuse you of being right. When you figure it out, make sure you tell Julius. He'll love to hear all about it. Lucas Grimace. He'd been nervous enough to face Silas. He didn't know if he could handle Julius. Silas had been harsh during their last confrontation, but Julius completely ignored him, walking away with a look of disgust. The billionaire CEO's runaway wife. 
Written by E.T. Watson. Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson. Chapter 19. I didn't cheat on Sarah, Lucas announced. I want you to know that. I know. You do? Lucas looked at him. How? Ava. Silas sighed. As unassuming as she is, most people don't realize how sharp she is. Maybe it came from all those years her sister isolated her growing up. But she is very observant. It's probably where Lexi learned it. Seeing Lucas's confusion, Silas explained further. Ava saw you on one of your shopping trips. She said it wasn't just you and your secretary. Your sister was also there. And you didn't show either of them much interest while they shopped. She also said you didn't shame the fact that she got a signed agreement. Even if you didn't care for Sarah, the marriage was still a contract to your daughter. Lucas felt as if he lifted off his chest. It was amazing to be believed. He never underrated it again. Now, he just had to convince Sarah. Perhaps he should ask Ava to tell her. Sarah would just assume she was being coached, and he didn't want her to strain her relationships with her friends. Hey, Dad! John and Theo suddenly burst into the room. Finally, my boys emerged from their gamer den to join the real world. Silas breathes. I should take a picture to commemorate. Ah, come on, Dad. Sean pulled his eyes. Yeah, stop being weird. Theo seconded. Where is everyone, anyway? Outside, playing with the dog. We got a dog? The boys asked in shock. No, our guests brought it. Silas said. So if you want to play with it, you better get down there before supper. They didn't need any further encouragement taking off for the backyard. Silas chuckled, shaking his head. For years, the kids had been asking for a pet. Ava always said no, and he would never contradict her, especially considering her history of family. Why didn't you ever give the kids a pet? Lucas said, knowing Silas never denied his children their wishes. Ava had a traumatic experience with dogs when she was young. She's been terrified of them ever since. Her sister, Silas nodded. It seemed everything always came back to Marilyn and the torments she inflicted on Ava. It was remarkable Ava conquered as many as she had over the years. It was a true testament to her inner strength and constantly surprised him. That's unfortunate. Well, Sarah helped her with her fear of horses. So maybe she can help with her fear of dogs. Sarah? Really? Silas nodded. Sarah boarded her horse in the city so she would take Ava to the stable every now and again. I guess they started with standing outside the stall with treats and progressed to grooming and such until Ava finally attempted to get in the saddle. Silas remembered her unadulterated joy at actually riding it after years of avoiding horses. She was so excited she couldn't wait to tell him at dinner and burst into his office. Ava practically left him to his heart, throwing her arms around him and passionately kissing him, overcome by sheer goodness and without a thought about who might see them. Sarah had been there with video and It was too soon to say 
it would be the same story with dogs. But just watching Ava cautiously petting the corgi was promising. When it came to dogs, German Shepherds, Golden Retrievers, or American Bulldogs were among the most mentioned breeds from the boys. But there were plenty of smaller breeds Ava would be more willing to consider. Sarah said corgis were herding dogs, so they had plenty of energy for five kids, despite their small size. Perhaps they could organize a few more of these playdates while Sarah and Zoe were in town to allow Ava time to get used to the idea of a dog. Then maybe they could be Sarah. While Silas's thoughts wandered, Lucas's were equally consuming. Sarah and Ava were closer than he imagined. If they willingly shared secrets and fears, to think she helped Ava conquer a fear she harbored since she was a child, would she ever cease to amaze him or remind him what an utter fool he had been? They left the office to join everyone outside. Silas immediately embraced Ava, kissing her temple, bowing his head to kiss her neck. As his hands rubbed their still small stomach, though they watched the kids play. Sean and Theo now monopolized the dog's attention, but Lexi and the younger kids had retreated to the large playset and played in the sand, so all seemed to be enjoying themselves. Amazingly, the corgi still had the energy to burn, and the pup gamely kept up with the older boys. Lucas watched with a regretful smile. The love Silas openly showered on Ava was almost awkward to watch. But at the same time, Lucas wished Sarah would allow him to even hold her hand. Even now, she pointedly ignored him, focusing on the kids. Lucas's gaze followed hers, and he watched Zoe as she and the younger boys built a sandcastle as well as roads for their toy cars. He frowned. Perhaps he should have a playset and sandbox installed in their own backyard. It was clear Zoe enjoyed playing outside. Maybe if he installed one, Sarah would see he was serious about wanting to make it work. How are you feeling? Silas asked, hugging Ava close. Good. I have to admit, Daisy is a cute puppy, and the kids love her. We can come over again if you'd like. Sarah said. Playing with kids her own age is good for Zoe, too. I would love that. Ava smiled. When Macy is in Paris, I don't have many people around I can call friends. Besides, we still have a lot to discuss. Sarah gave her a strange smile. Lucas looked down from one to the other, wondering what it was they chatted about while he and Silas had their talk. He had a sinking feeling it was about him, given Sarah's pensive expression. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes? Ava acknowledged Duncan. Dinner is almost ready, and I originally intended to serve it in the dining room. But perhaps you'd like it al fresco instead? Yes. We'll all enjoy that. Thank you. Of course, ma'am. Duncan bowed with a smile before retreating inside. Moments later, he reappeared, setting up plates and silverware on square patio tables pushed together. Duncan retreated inside, once again, only to emerge with another trolley, this one laden with food. Silas whistled sharply. All right. Let's bring it in. Much to Lucas's surprise, the kids responded almost instantly. Lexi heard it a little while to the patio, while Sean and Thea managed one more toss, racing the dog to the patio to join everyone. Ava scooped up Ben while Silas gathered ice. Duncan was on hand with washcloths for them to clean up. Zoe ran out to Sarah, who hugged him tight and laughed at the sand and grit clinging. Duncan handed Lucas another washcloth with a smile. Awkwardly, 
Lucas approached and wiped Zoe's hands on the face clean. Sand seemed to cling everywhere, and Lucas was beginning to understand what Silas had meant. Once the kids were clean, they sat down at the tables. Silas and Lucas sat at the opposite ends, while Ava, Sarah, and the kids sat along either side. Lexi sat between Ben and Isaac, so she could assist her mother in taking care of them, while Sarah inexplicably ended up next to Lucas, with only Zoe separating them. Theo and Sean sat near their father, impatiently waiting as Duncan served steamed vegetables and lasagna. Starting from youngest to oldest, Duncan worked his way around the tables until everyone's plates and glasses were filled. Then, with a bow, he left them to eat. While they enjoyed their dinner, Duncan offered a bowl of dog food and water to David, who happily inhaled it before seemingly passing out from exhaustion. The corgi didn't make a sound throughout the meal, contentedly napping on his face So, does this mean we can get a dog? He asked. Ava did it, but didn't say no. There was no denying how happy the kids were playing with Daisy and the pup. It was very cute and gentle. You think you're ready for such a commitment? Silas asked. Taking care of a dog is a big responsibility. Duncan has enough to do without having to feed and walk and wash the dog. And you'll have to clean up any accidents you might have in the house and the yard every day, unless you want to step in. We can handle it, Sean said. Yeah! Besides, we weren't asking you. We all know Mom has the final say. Theo seconded. A man is the king of his castle. Silas reminded him. Yeah, king. <laughs> right below the queen. Theo said, holding up his hand and gesturing at their mother. Unless Grandma though, is here. Sean reminded him. Right. Then it's Mom, Grandma O, and then Dad. Theo gestured again. Don't forget, Duncan. Lexi said. Right. Mom, Grandma, oh, Duncan, then Dad. Silas glared as the boys broke out in a fit of laughter. Fighting her own mirth, Ava patted his hand and comfort. But from where Lucas sat, Silas didn't seem particularly upset, even as he raised Ava's hand to his lips to kiss her. Was this... So, are all of you excited Julius, Macy, and the kids will be coming back soon? Sarah asked, saving Silas with a change of subject. Well, Lexi sure is. Sean teased. Yeah, Lexi and Caden sitting in a tree. K-I-S-S-I-N-G. Theo said. Lexi blushed bright red. Real mature, you two. At least Caden doesn't act like a two-year-old. And he's the only one who has any interest in music. Unlike you, uncultured swine. Oink, oink. Theo and Sean snorted to each other. Who would have thought Lexi was into younger men? Theo laughed. We're only three years apart. Lexi are. And what about you and Arya? I thought you two Skyping pretty late last night. Theo suddenly fell silent, blushing even deeper than Lexi. Lucas glanced toward Silas to see he was rubbing his temple, as if trying to prevent a migraine. Ava held his other hand for support, though she was having a difficult time controlling her laughter. Sarah seemed equally amused almost shaking at the expense of a father whose children were growing up much too fast for his liking. Lucas sipped his drink, trying to maintain a neutral expression. Silas was an imposing figure in an office setting, but apparently at home, he was at the mercy of his children. 
looking again at Silas, Lucas saw his host glaring at him, in as much to say, Laugh it up, this is you in a few years. Lucas glanced at Zoe, happily eating her dinner. How many years before she started thinking about boys? What was he going to do when she started dating? Perhaps he could make no boys until you're 25 or more? Thank you so much for coming. Ava said, hugging Sarah tight as they got ready to leave. Zoe danced as Lucas helped her into her coat. Ben and Isaac sat on the steps, petting and kissing Daisy, fighting disappointed tears and not wanting the puppy to go. Ava sighed as she looked at her son. Apparently she was going to have to work for her version to a lot more quickly than she did with horses. Come here and give us a hug, Munchkin. Silas said to a bouncy Without hesitation, she ran up to him, accepting a hug as he picked her up. While the business world feared and respected her, there was none of that in his way. Don't worry, Uncle Sai. I'll come back soon, okay? Silas chuckled. His name proved too difficult for her to pronounce properly, so he suggested his nickname. He rather liked his new title. With a big smile, he said, I hope I have a little girl just like you. After dinner, Ava and Sarah mostly talked about the new baby. Lucas had been surprised to learn Silas and Ava were expecting another, as Ben was supposed to be the last. But maybe he shouldn't have been so shocked. They said the same thing when Isaac was born, after all. Don't worry. Zoe said. I already talked to Grandma Yaya. I know what she told me. What? Silas was proud of her. She said, very soon you'll have more girls than you'll ever know what to do with. And who is Grandma Yaya? Silas asked. Clearly oh, I know. Ava looked at Sarah. She's your college roommate's aunt, right? Sarah nodded. Grandma Yaya is very smart. She told Mommy I'd be a girl too. Zoe said. She's always right. Well, I hope so. Silas smiled, humoring her. He planted a kiss on her temple before setting her on her feet. Zoe happily returned to Lucas, raising her arms so he could pick her up. Lucas held her close, liking the way she fully accepted him, even if he had missed three years of her life. Glancing at Silas, he noticed the other was smirking. The expression was surprising enough. But Lucas suddenly felt embarrassed, as if he had been caught doing something bad. All right. Sarah took the leash from her back. Daisy wiggled loose from her annoying fans, trotting up to Sarah obediently and accepting her leash without protest. Ben whimpered, quickly advancing to a line. Ava scooped him up, whispering words of comfort and promising Zoe and the puppy come back to play another day. Yes, she would definitely have to work on her fear. Sarah gave the boy a sympathetic smile and seconded Ava's promise as they headed out to meet Alan, waving at the Silas and Ava followed as far as the door, waving at the Oh, Sarah, as soon as Mace is in town, we have to set up a play date for all of the kids. Come, Daisy. Absolutely. It's a day. The Billionaire CEO's Runaway Wife Written by E.T. Watson Narrated by Daniel Cuddy, Celia Stone, Lucy Topps, and Jim Swanson Chapter 20 Lydia pranced into the restaurant happy whenever she caught the eye of an admirer. 
She was well aware how good she looked in her cocktail dress. Smiling and winking at those she passed, Lydia enjoyed the irritated glares of their dates almost as much as the leers of the men. Sorry I'm late. Lydia greeted as she joined the girls at the bar. The others forced smiles, some rolling their eyes when they thought she wasn't looking. Though she knew these five for several years, they weren't friends. As socialites, they couldn't afford to be friends or even friendly with each other. The social world was doggy dog, and none of them were going to let themselves fall behind the others, which was the only reason they got together for these girls' nights in the first place. So glad you could join us, Anne said. She was something of the group leader, but that position was honorary and subject to change if she lost enough favour and support from the others. Lydia never tired of trying to chip away at that support. Traffic, you know. Anne raised her eyebrow but didn't challenge the whole excuse. She had far better ammo for testing Lydia. With a fake smile, she asked. So, what's this I hear about your sister-in-law returning? Uh, she wishes. Lydia laughed. I always knew she'd try to crawl back, but it won't do her any good. When my brother makes a decision, it is final. You'll never take her back. Really? Is that what it looked like to you, Andrea? They looked pretty close to me when they were at the Good Eats. The brunette answered. They were all cozied up at the same table. Maybe you're seeing things. Lydia glared at her. My brother is in love with Madeline. It's been three years, Anne said. He hasn't proposed. In fact, he hasn't taken her out even once. Well, it would look bad if he got engaged right after his divorce. Really? Anne smirked, nodding to Andrea. The other took out her phone and showed the screen picturing Lucas seated next to Sarah. Between them sat a three-year-old looking very much like a miniature version of Sarah. But that couldn't be. He doesn't seem concerned to be seen out for them. And smiled, enjoying Lydia's discomfort. I wonder who the kid's father is. Lydia's cheeks went red. Lucas never said anything about a baby. In fact, he claimed he never touched Sarah, not once. Then in confidence, she said. Must be someone else's. I know for a fact, Lucas never slept with her. He wouldn't even touch her. There is no way that kid is his. Really? Because he looks quite happy with her. Anne said as Andrea displayed another picture of Lucas carrying the three-year-old. He did look quite happy with the little one in his arms. I don't know what kind of trick she's up to, but I got rid of her once. I'll do it again. She doesn't have a backbone to stand up to me. Be careful. Be careful you don't cross the line. And warm through the frown. Oh, please. I'm untouchable. Lydia love. And so. You know, Marilyn thought she was untouchable, too. So did Catherine and Janine. Who? Catherine Trent. Marilyn Carlyle and Jenna Riker and said they all thought they were untouchable until they crossed the line. Lydia frowned. The name sounded familiar, especially Carlyle. She shrugged. So what happened to them? Well, Catherine busses tables and works at a grocery store part-time to take care of her man-child husband who can't hold a steady job to save his life. And they're having another kid. Answer. Marilyn's father cut both her and her mother out. I heard they moved in with her mother's family somewhere on the West Coast. She's still waiting for her big break. And Jenna, she's doing 10 to 15 for fraud, tax evasion, and embezzlement. If you don't want to end up like them, I suggest you be more careful. My brother won't let that happen. Besides, a few text messages, and she'll be gone. Are you serious? And Scott. How dumb can you get? Excuse.
Excuse me? Did you use a burner phone? Anne asked. At least they wouldn't be able to trace the messages back to you. What? I deleted them. Yeah. From your phone. What about hers? Anne asked. If Sarah kept them, you're screwed. Look at her. Sarah had never responded to any of her messages, so she assumed the others simply deleted them after reading them. Who would keep them? Unless... Unless Sarah intended to drag them all through the mud. What if Sarah kept her mother's texts too? Or not else? Lucas would blow his top to say nothing of a lawyer if Sarah decided to make a case of Shit. Anne smirked at her expression and Lydia thought her face stood up again. Compounding the problem was what happened at the party. Madeline had confronted Sarah expecting the ladder to shrivel up and retreat. Instead, the likes of Silas and Ava Prescott stood up for her, and Sarah turned the tables openly mocking Madeline in front of everyone. Madeline had no choice but to retreat and seek out Lydia for support. They planned to double-team her as they used to, but by then Sarah was seated at a table with the likes of Silas, leaving them sorely outnumbered. What was worse? was the gossip about her dress, how gorgeous she looked, praise for her outgoing personality, and how close she appeared to be with the press fronts. These were not rumours Lydia could ignore or allow to spread. Now there was a child? What did Lucas think he was doing letting himself be photographed with the kid in his arms? What if Sarah showed him the text messages? Whatever Lydia did, she would have to do it quickly. Oh, have you heard? One of the girls suddenly asked, changing the subject. Rosemary Thomas is finally going to reveal herself to the world. I love her books. Another said. Do you know when? At the end of the month, the publisher is going to have a book launch party for the 10th book. They're making it a masquerade. So everyone will be wearing masks. And at the end of the night, Rosemary will reveal herself. I love it! You know, Rosemary had to have pitched the whole idea. She's so creative. I wonder if I can get an invite. I heard it's really exclusive. The publisher only sent out like 100 VIP invites. But I guess they also sent a bunch of special tickets for people to win. Like their website is hosting a Rosemary is my favorite author essay contest. I heard on the radio, they got a couple of invitations they'll be giving away at the end of the week. What radio station? How do you enter? The conversation continued as they searched on their phones for more information. Normally, Lydia would have joined them. She wasn't much of a reader, but she hated missing out when it came to events. At the moment, however, she was consumed with what to do about Sarah. Three years ago, Sarah disappeared, and Lydia was certain she would never return. There had been no word, no rumours, and no contact. There was no reason to suspect she would ever be seen again. And yet, now she was back. And not just back. Sarah was a completely different person. The dress she wore at the party was bold and gorgeous. The Sarah Lydia remembered wouldn't be caught dead in something like that. What was more, she wasn't afraid to stand up to Madeline. The old Sarah never told her that. She always quietly faded away. What happened to her to make such a dramatic change? In fact, Lydia wasn't certain her old tricks could work on the new Sarah. And what about the child? That was something that couldn't be ignored. They absolutely had to get rid of the kid. It couldn't be that difficult to fake a paternity chest, could it? If Sarah was using the kid to get child support, she would have to prove Lucas was the father. Lydia would have to figure out what hospital she used, then pay the technicians to fake the test. Yeah, that would work. Maybe Lucas already thought of that. Maybe he was planning the same thing. She would have to talk to him. It wouldn't be good to interfere with his plans with her own. If they worked together, they could get rid of Sarah that much faster before she revealed any compromising information. But first thing was first. Lydia took out her phone to send Madeline a text. We need to talk. We need to make a plan for how to deal with that bitch. I'll let you know when I'm on my way. 